All right, next challenge is Fallout. So again, what we're gonna do is we are going to get a new instance of the contract, meaning we're gonna deploy a new instance of the contract. And because we're changing the state of the blockchain, meaning we're writing something to it, we know that we have to pay the necessary gas fee. So of course, be sure that A, your MetaMask wallet is pointing to the Robston network and that you have sufficient ether in order to pay for the necessary gas. So I do. So I'm gonna click on get new, uh, get new instance, and we're gonna give that transaction an opportunity to successfully get mined, which means it's gonna be permanently recorded on the blockchain. Now, as we wait for the confirmation for that transaction, let's take a look at what the objective of this challenge is. And as you can see, our transaction has been confirmed. So we went through and we're ready to begin playing this game. So the uh, whole point of this challenge is to claim ownership of the contract below, like we did in the previous challenge. And that's the only thing that we have to do. Okay, now they're saying that some things that might help might be the Solidity Remix IDE. So if I were you, I would copy and paste this transaction into Remix. And if you don't know what that is, Remix is a very well-known Ethereum browser-based uh, IDE or text editor, code editor. So let's just uh, copy this code here and follow their instructions and see what they say. Let's see what happens. So let's just click on uh, just an untitled contract file name. Let's paste it in here and let's see if anything looks interesting for us after we've read the code here, okay? So anyway, we're just following their instructions. Now, the whole point is to claim ownership of this contract. And um, of course, the first line of this contract has the Pragma direct Directive, which as you now know, always specifies the version of the Solidity compiler that this code must be able to get compiled through. And what's happening here is the safe math library is being imported into this contract. And I don't know exactly where they are. Okay, and it's being used right over here. So when you import an external library into a contract, you import all of its functionality and it, all its methods and whatever kind of publicly available state variables exist in that contract. So we're importing a library here and then we're using it for unsigned integers that are a size of 256 bits. So in case you don't know what an unsigned integer is, it's basically anything that's zero or a positive number. An unsigned integer can never be a negative number, just so you know. So zero and above is what an unsigned integer is. A value, a number value that could contain a negative value would be a signed integer. So in any, in any case, this library is being used for UN 256s, and I guess that's adding certain uh, mathematical safety precautions to the use of this value, these, these types of integers here that are unsigned integers. In any case, we have that, and then what we have here is again uh, a mapping of addresses to integers. And you can always kind of think of a mapping as a hash map or a dictionary in another language. I kind of just like to see it as a kind of internal database that's only available within this contract. So it has a mapping and again, it has a state variable called owner and it's of a type address, which means it's, a, it's an Ethereum address. So we want to claim ownership here. So if we look at the functions here, we see what appears to be the constructor here, because it says constructor, and constructors always are named the same name as the contract, uh, although this is sort of not a best practice any longer. You can use the keyword constructor, but anyway, this is the constructor, and as you know, a constructor 
only gets executed when the contract first deploys. And we didn't deploy the contract even though we pressed this get new instance button. So somebody got to execute this code and whoever deployed the contract is the owner. So this is the only way that I currently see in this contract, however, to become the owner. In no other function in this contract do I see the owner variable being set, which indicates who the owner in this contract is. So this is very interesting. Now, of course, one of their recommendations here was to look at this code in the Solidity Remix IDE. And if we look here, Fallout actually looks weird. The constructor keyword Fallout. You see this here? This doesn't look like an L. It looks like a one to me. And that's different than in the name of this contract. So what could that possibly mean? Well, the first thing that I'm gonna do to investigate here is I'm going to get the instance of our contract and I wanna see, of course, who the owner is. And the owner is currently not my player account. So remember, if you wanna get your player's Ethereum address or what we call account, then just enter the term player in your console. So we're currently not the contract owner. Now, one thing that you should always be paying attention of is that contracts have what's called an application binary interface or ABI for short. And they rem they represent the kind of, they represent the functions that a front end can call on a smart contract, like all the publicly available functions. And what you can see here is when we type in or when we get the ABI of the contract that we're working with here, we get allocate, which is a public function. We get send allocation. We get uh, allocator balance, so forth and so on. And we also get the name of the construct. We get the constructor as a public function. And this should never, ever be the case. A constructor is not a public function that's available on the ABI of a smart contract. So this is wrong. And the problem here, obviously, in case you haven't seen it yet, is that there's a typo here. And this is not an L. The second L in Fallout is not an L. It's actually a number, which means that this is not the constructor. This is actually a public function that anybody can execute. And as you can see here, whoever executes this function gets to become the owner. Now, in case you forgot, MSG in Solidity is a global variable that represents a transaction. So the only way to start up a contract or execute a function on a contract is by submitting a transaction to the network or to the Ethereum blockchain. And that's kind of one way to look at Ethereum. It's a giant transaction processing machine in addition to being like an immutable blockchain. But message, MSG, represents a transaction. And the sender of the transaction is accessible through msg.sender. So in other words, whoever sends a transaction to call this function is gonna become the owner. So that's gonna help us, or that's, gonna, that's actually the only thing that's gonna allow us to win. So as you recall, if I do an await contract.owner, just want you to see that that's this address and player, which is me, is this address. So I am currently not the owner. Now what I'm gonna do, I don't know if I have to do await here because I wanna execute a function that's gonna change something. Anyway, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna call the contract and then I'm gonna call the FAL1OUT function here because this is not the constructor. So that's a boo-boo. And of course, because we are changing the state of the blockchain, because we're changing this internal state variable here called owner, we have to pay the relevant gas fee. Whenever you change the state of the blockchain, you have to pay gas. So I'm gonna click confirm here, and I'm gonna wait for that transaction to get successfully mined. And here we go, it just did. So now, if I look at who the owner of the contract is by executing contract.owner, lo and behold, it is me. 
So that means we successfully beat this challenge. And now what we're going to do is we're going to submit an instance and we're going to pay the gas fee and we're going to confirm this. And once this gets confirmed, we have successfully completed this challenge. So the bottom line here, the bottom line here is firstly, you have to be aware of obnoxious typos like this, because that could really trip somebody up. I would, you know, it would have taken me a really long time to see that. Secondly, don't name your constructor the name the same name as the contract. Always use the keyword constructor. That is the best practice way for defining constructors and contracts. And that's the big takeaway. So even things that you wouldn't notice that are problems um, end up being pretty catastrophic in the real world. So keep that in mind and let's move on to the next challenge.